Hi, Daniel. It's Kate. Hello. <laughs> you might want to mute when you're uh, not talking, just for clicky sound. Okay, we'll do. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Assemblywoman Luz Rivas, and I have the honor of representing the East San Fernando Valley in the State Assembly. I hope that you're all staying safe. COVID-19 is still out there and it's running rampant in our communities. Although the stay-at-home orders have been lifted, we must continue to follow social distancing guidelines and make sure to protect ourselves and our loved ones. As past chair of the Joint Legislative Committee on Emergency Management, I focused on ensuring that our state is properly equipped to handle emergencies, such as wildfires and this pandemic. However, we must also be prepared to manage other natural disasters, such as earthquakes, which are very common in our community. And that's why we're here today. Today marks the 50th anniversary of the Silmar San Fernando earthquake. In 1971, the biggest earthquake in Los Angeles history struck the Northeast San Fernando Valley. Flattening freeways, uh, collapsing hospitals, and damaging our infrastructure. The San Fernando Valley Veterans Hospital in Silmar completely collapsed and unfortunately killed more than 40 individuals. Dozens of freeway bridges on the five freeway collapsed leaving people trapped in their cars at that time. There was the lower dam at the Van Norman Reservoir spilled 3.6 billion gallons of water into Granada Hills and Mission Hills, making sure that people had to quickly evacuate their homes. The reality was, is that we were not prepared for an earthquake of this magnitude in 1971. But over the last few decades, uh, state lawmakers have passed legislation to strengthen our infrastructure and improve the state's response to emergencies. I remember as a little girl growing up hearing so many stories about this earthquake from family members that at the time were living in Pacoima. I heard how scared they were and the impact it had on them, especially to make sure that they were prepared for natural disasters. You know, we all think that this cannot happen to us and a lot of us are not prepared, but there's a lot of things that we can do to make sure that we are prepared for the next big earthquake. And that's why we're here today. And I'm very excited uh, to have um, these guests, two special guests today on the this anniversary of the 1971 earthquake. I'm joined today by Daniel Cepeda from the Structural Engineers Association of Southern California and Kate Long, Chief Op Operating Officer of the Dr. Lucy Jones Center for Science and Society. Uh, Daniel and Kate will share with us some of the lessons learned from the 1971 earthquake and how we can better prepare for future earthquakes. Um, just a reminder, if you have any questions, please leave them on the comment section and we will try to address them at the end of, towards the end of this Facebook Live. So I wanna start with Daniel from the Structural Engineers Association. Welcome Daniel to our Facebook Live. Uh, and so I know you wanna talk a little bit about the history and you, will you wanna share a presentation with us. Yes, yes I do. Uh, it's fairly short, but uh, I do have a few slides to share for you guys. Okay, that's great. Would you like me to start? Go ahead. Yes, let's go ahead and start. All right, let's see. Can you guys see the presentation? I'm assuming yes. <laughs> Sorry. I, I not sure. I can't see it. I'm not sure if we could see it. On the see you. Okay, it's coming up. Okay, great. Okay, okay. So we can see it, so go ahead. All right, thank you. So <clears throat> it's a fairly small presentation. Again, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to uh, speak a few, a few minutes here. Uh, as, as previously mentioned, my name is Daniel Zapeta. I'm uh, with Degen Cove Engineers, but I, I do co-chair the existing buildings committee for our CIOSC uh, uh, chapter, which is it's the Structural Engineers Association of Southern California. 
and my specialty is is dealing with existing um, buildings. So, uh, you know, Luz, uh, you did a great uh, job reminding us of what happened 50 years ago in 1971. Uh, as you can see here, this is a photograph of, of the, uh, of the um, hospital that actually collapsed and killed most, mo most of the fatalities that happened in this earthquake actually happened in this collapse. Uh, it, was a, it was a fairly significant earthquake that happened. Uh, it was a 6.5 magnitude earthquake and it happened uh, about 10 miles northeast of Silmar. And it taught us a lot from a structural engineering perspective. It taught us a lot about how concrete buildings specifically behave. Uh, you could see this figure here on the screen. Uh, prior, to 19, prior to the 1971 uh, Silmar earthquake, we actually did not put enough reinforcing inside our elements, inside our structural elements. And for that reason, they didn't, they didn't do very well in an earthquake. You can see on this figure, uh, the amount of rebar, the little squiggly lines that you see in this, in this figure represent reinforcing. And then after the earthquake, we learned so much that it actually changed our codes and standards. And from that point on, we learned to put a lot more reinforcing in those walls. And you know, these lessons were taught to us over and over. Uh, and the 71 earthquake is, is, a, is a key earthquake that, that kind of highlighted it. But then afterwards, we kept getting reminded. This, this is a photograph of the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, which we also see a lack of proper reinforcing. Uh, <clears throat> you see the 1994 Northridge earthquake uh, also highlighted this issue. And the problem is not that um, these, these buildings were built prior to 71. So uh, the problem is not with new buildings. The problem is that what happens to all the buildings that were left behind uh, prior to the 1971 earthquake. There's also other things that the earthquakes have highlighted throughout the years, uh, not just the concrete ones. We, all, we see every earthquake, we see a lot of damage. Uh, on the top left corner, you see unreinforced masonry buildings. Uh, you see homes that oftentimes uh, get disconnected from their foundation and they fall down. Those are those what we call, we call them as cripple walls. You probably have heard on the news in the last few years a lot about these buildings called soft story buildings, which is the photograph that you see uh, where a building actually collapsed over a, over a vehicle. Uh, and then sometimes we refer to these other taller steel buildings as pre-Northridge steel moment frame buildings. I think what I'm trying to tell you here is that uh, the, not, the 71 really highlighted a specific deficiency in some of our buildings, but other earthquakes have up actually uh, enlighten us as to what other problems happen in our building start with these older buildings. <clears throat> and we've done a lot to, to, to try to make things better. Um, you see here on the screen, a lot of screenshots about different, uh, different programs across the state. Starting from the top left corner, you see that San Francisco, for example, has implemented some, some pretty uh, uh, stringent requirements about private schools. Uh, we also have our, our K through 12 schools that have done a full on inventory to try to understand their, their buildings. Uh, the, the universities uh, are currently in the process of evaluating all their buildings and making sure that they upgrade them to meet certain uh, uh, seismic standards. Our infrastructures, both bridges, water structures, they've all gone through a major retrofit program and, over the past 20 years. On the bottom left corner, you see uh, that graph there is, is, is a screenshot of all the hospitals in the state. Uh, all the hospitals in the state have gone through and done a, a tremendous amount of work in the retrofit. And then finally, um, kind of towards the right hand corner of the, of the page there, you see what our, city, our cities have done. The city of LA, for example, has implemented a pretty aggressive schedule, uh, a pretty aggressive program, I'm sorry, to actually retrofit a lot of the a lot of the buildings that, that we see that, that have been noted uh, in past years to have um, you know had issues, so there's a lot that we've learned, but yet there's a lot that we have done. Now, now the question is, you know, can we do more? And I, I want to show you a, a little graph. I know that it's I don't want to get too technical, but I think with COVID, I think we've all started to see a lot of graphs up on the screen, you know, from scientists. So hopefully this 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 helps you that 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 helps you understand this. Um, we often hear uh, this term resiliency. 
and, and our news. And, and we all want our communities to be resilient. We want to make sure that after an event, whether it be seismic, fire, anything, we're able to get back to business right away. Uh, I'm just going back to COVID, you know, it's, it's been almost a year now uh, that we haven't gone back to business as we, as it was prior to COVID. And, and we can see how, how strange, how, how stressful it has been to our society. Well, it's the same concept with any other, with any other um, hazard. Uh, here in this graph, you see that, you know, the, the horizontal uh, line represents kind of uh, life as normal, right? And then an event hits, uh, the event hits it right, uh, you know, right at this peak. And then all these, all these functions, all these, all these things that we sometimes take for granted, right? Our freeways, our infrastructure, our homes, they all get affected. They all get affected by this event. And then it takes us a while to get back to normal. So as this, as time travels, right? Uh, we actually start getting back to normal slowly. And what I, what I wanna say is that there's a lot more that we can do understanding what happened in previous earthquakes, including what happened in 1971, is that one of the things that we wanna do is we wanna make sure that when an event hits us, we have less, we have less uh, functions being affected. So the more of these buildings that we fix, the more that we repair them, the less of them that are, the, the, the less impactful these earthquakes are gonna be. And therefore, this, this big triangle is going to be a much smaller triangle. It's very, very similar to what you hear on the news about let's flatten the curve, right? When it comes to COVID, let's all stay home. Let's make sure that we don't overwhelm our hospitals. It's the same concept. What we want to do is let's make sure that we fix as many of our buildings as possible so that that way when the earthquake comes, we don't have to remain, you know, we can go back in and, and use them. So with that, uh, I only have those few slides. I just wanted to stimulate the conversation with that. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll toss it back to you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for sharing um, some of this information on history and also geeking out and sharing some graphs yeah. and the science behind it. I think it's very important for all of us to understand. And I think, you know, you made it very simple for us, uh, you know, I know engineers, you know, structural engineers have worked for years after Silmar um, to retrofit and make sure that our buildings, um, you know, have, so there's a lot of now seismic requirements. And I've read recently about the laws that the state enacted because of Silmar, you know, to yep. make sure that our buildings. Um, and so it's very interesting to me that the impact that this earthquake had for all of us, not just for the San Fernando Valley, but for the whole state, right? And mm -hmm. what I would just, I have a, a couple questions for you. Um, and what are engineers, what's the next thing? What do you think engineers are working on to make our roads and our buildings safer? Right. So, you know, as mentioned before, um, we, we have done a lot since the 1971 earthquake in terms of uh, repairing our infrastructure. But there's a lot more to do because what happens is that there are more existing buildings in our, in our, in our building stock that were built prior to 71 that we, that we construct every year. So the problem is, is very large. So far, all, even though we've done a, a tremendous amount of work are, uh, strengthening some of those buildings, there's still a lot more to do. Uh, a lot, some of the things that we're doing is we're working with cities. Our, our organization, for example, is working with um, uh, the city of LA, as an example, the city of uh, Pasadena, Beverly Hills, West Hollywood, all these Southern California cities, and, 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 and basically advising them as to how they can improve their building stock. So from an existing building point of view, there's still a lot to be done. Uh, there's still a lot of buildings to be done. And then, and then moving forward in terms of the codes, in terms of new codes coming in, we're also working with, we're also working to get better at that. One of the things that we currently do is we, we design our existing, uh, we design our new buildings to meet a certain standard. Uh, we're trying to get our codes to be a little bit uh, more open-minded and make sure that we are not just looking at the at the at the building itself, 
but we're to try to figure out how that building actually fits within the community so that, that after an earthquake, we, we make sure that those key buildings in our neighborhood actually are functional. For example, hospitals, right? We all want our hospitals to be functioning after an earthquake. They have to have a higher standard when we design them. So we're, we're, we're implementing new rules with the codes to make sure that, that we identify these critical infrastructure and critical buildings and making sure that we design them to a much higher standard. And that's, a, that's an open debate, right? Uh, as, to, as to which are, what is a critical building? Um, prior to the pandemic, for example, we would say that if you had a if you had a supermarket, you know, you don't really need to design it to these very high levels. Mm -hmm. But now we've learned, uh, it, you know, the COVID has taught us that uh, supermarkets are essential, right? It's not just essential workers; we need the building to to yes. house all that all that food. So we probably need to think about how we design uh, buildings like that. And those are the kinds of changes that we're now doing uh, because of what we're experiencing. No, it, it's great to hear that you're, every type of emergency that we're experiencing, you're learning more and you're applying it Absolutely. to other emergencies. Like you just mentioned, learning something about during COVID and you're applying it to earthquakes and thinking about how is this going to affect other natural disasters that we may have. So it's, it's great to hear that. I have one more question. Uh, so I'm thinking of just the average resident that owns a home. You know, like I my house was built in the 1950s. I have mm. no idea if it had if it's been retrofitted in any way to be safe. You know, and it concerns me. And I know a lot of the Northeast San Fernando Valley has a lot of homes built in the 50s and 60s. You know, prior to the 71 earthquake. I assume, well, it survived the earthquake, so I'm fine. But how do I know and what can I do to make sure that my home right. is safe? Well, first of all, I, I want to make sure that our audience understands that just because you've survived an earthquake doesn't make your house bulletproof, right? Earthquake proof. I think that's a very common misconception. Mm -hmm. I always joke around. I say, you know, we've all survived a 9.0 earthquake. It just happened that it was in Japan, not here. <laughs> Uh, so it, it really has to do with the proximity of where the shaking is relative to your home. Uh, a lot of the homes that you mentioned, for example, uh, were, you know, in, in my slideshow, I show a small house that actually kind of mm -hmm. came off its foundation. These old homes weren't properly tied down to the foundation because, you know, honestly, at that, at that time, our industry just didn't know any better. Uh, and one of the things that I think homeowners can do is if they have an elevated floor, uh, an, elevated, an elevated floor, meaning as you walk into your house, you have to go a few steps up and then you walk into your house, you probably have, you probably have a, raised, uh, a raised floor. Um, you, you, sometimes you see these little vents around your home. It's like a crawl uh, space under the house. It's like a crawl right? space, exactly, underneath yeah. Exactly. The reason that we used to do that in our industry is because it was much easier to run all the piping underneath your home to serve the different areas of your house. Well, that, that part of the building, if it's not properly reinforced, that, that creates a weakness. So one of the things that you can do, there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of specialty contractors that can go out to your home and they can crawl underneath that crawl space and, and let you know if, if it has the proper strengthening measures, meaning does it have plywood? Does it have these certain anchor bolts? So they can do an inspection. And then based on that, um, they can actually retrofit your building. And there's programs, there's, there's actual financial programs that the state, where, where the state, you can apply to the state and they give you some, some funding to help you, to help you with uh, repairing, repairing yes. your home. No, I have heard of those programs and what we will do, we will share a link to that program, you know, when afterwards my team, or you can call my office if you want to learn more about that. Uh, I remember it, um, learning about the program last year and thinking I need to do that too, right? Because <laughs> I, I have, you know, the previous owner didn't let me know if he did that. And so I have no idea if, if my home has been reinforced. I think a lot of us in the San Fernando Valley and anywhere that may have a home, may have a home that needs to be reinforced. So I think that's very helpful to hear. Okay. 
So yeah. thank you so much, Daniel, um, for that presentation. And I wanna move on to the next part of our Facebook Live. Uh, and, and we're gonna focus on preparing for an earthquake. And I'm very excited to have Kate Long from the Dr. Lucy Jones Center for Science and Society. Uh, she will talk to us about preparing for a natural disaster. So welcome, Kate. Thank you so much. And um, thank you for having me, Assemblymember Rivas. And uh, nice to hear from you, Daniel, um, that the state-sponsored program, uh, which uh, helps with bracing your house, is called Brace and Bolt. It's done by the California Earthquake Authority. Mm -hmm. And you can go to uh, earthquakebracebolt.com and find out about uh, signing up to get a grant to help offset the cost. Because most of us live in wood frame houses. Uh, and if we do, actually wood frame houses are pretty, are relatively earthquake resilient. They may in fact, you know, be damaged, uh, but they are less likely to collapse on you than some other types of construction. So uh, we often think that, the, that when we think of earthquake, we think, oh, I'm, I'm, it's never gonna happen. I don't need to prepare or Oh, I'm going to be crushed. Will I prepare? But actually, we are very likely uh, to survive the earthquake. And so there's a lot we can do to make a difference. Um, and I, I know we've had a hard year with pandemic, and it's hard to think about earthquake. I mean, really, something else to think about. Uh, we have so much on our plates. But uh, there's three things I can tell you for sure. And one is that we are going to have more damaging earthquakes. Uh, like the Silmar earthquake, like the Northridge earthquake. Uh, and, you know, if we lived in Alaska, we'd have winter coats. We have to prepare. And we have to prepare as individuals, as well as hoping that our, our uh, legislators and our, our engineers are helping us with the larger societal uh, problems. Uh, but we have to prepare as neighborhoods and families and individuals. Um, and the second thing I want to say is that I bet you're more prepared than you think you are. We all want to be more prepared, me included, uh, but there are a lot of things we've done to prepare for other reasons and they're going to help us after an earthquake. Uh, and the third thing is, uh, is really that there are so many things we can do. Some of them are easy, some of them are small, and they're going to make a big difference about how we survive, how we recover, how we get our lives back together after an earthquake. So um, there, are, there are an awful lot of steps available, easy laid out steps that can help you get prepared one bite at a time. My mother used to say, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. It's not just a one and done. What are you gonna do as part of your life that's gonna help you be more prepared? Uh, so uh, uh, Assembly Member Reba's staff is gonna put uh, a, some links up. My favorites are earthquakecountry.org and terremotos.org, really lay out some easy steps to getting prepared, you know, one bite at a time. But today, I thought what I'd do with my 10 minutes, because 10 minutes isn't a lot of time, is talk about being at home, because face it, we're all at home a lot now, right? More than we once were. So how can I be prepared in my home? And specifically, if I'm in my home all the time, where do I spend most of my time? Well, frankly, in bed, 30% of the day, in bed if you get eight hours. My husband and I like to watch TV in bed, so maybe more than eight hours. So I thought I'd start with my underbed kit. Here it is, hold on. Let me try and uh, adjust my screen just a little bit so you can see. So is that, I, you just have that under your bed, that bag at all times? A duffel bag that somebody gave me in college and I put it under my bed and it's not, my entire earthquake kit. I have earthquake supplies in different parts of my house. I I can, <laughs> um, in different parts of my house. Um, I have water because I, uh, I have a house that has a water heater. So uh, I've got 40 gallons of water it's right there. Done, one and done. Um, I have, I save, I have food. I have a, a evacuation bag in case I need to leave, you know, evacuate. Uh, for fire as well as for earthquake. Earthquake, you don't want to leave if you don't have to. You want to stay in your home if you can. So I have my kit. It's been under my bed for a couple years. I dusted it off this morning. So let's see what's in it. Uh, start with, let's say you're in bed when the earthquake hits. What do you do? Well, the same thing you do whenever 
you feel shaking. You don't wait to see if it's strong shaking. You drop, cover, hold on. Now, if you're in bed, you do a modified drop, cover, hold on. You don't have to get out of bed, but you do want to make yourself small, curl up, cover your head with a pillow, hang on and wait for the shaking to stop. The reason we drop, cover, hold on, or whatever its variant is, is that we don't want to be hit by things falling and flying in our homes. In a big earthquake, your structure is at risk, but in many smaller earthquakes, the thing that's gonna hurt you are the things inside your house. So for instance, the last person who died from an earthquake, it was her television that hit her. Oh, wow. That was during the Napa earthquake. So there are uh, earthquakecountry.org has lots of ways you can help um, secure the things in your home. But in the meantime, I'm still gonna curl up in a ball if I feel shaky. Shaking stops, I hear car alarms, I hear dogs barking, I hear my kids maybe in the next room yelling for me. I tell them, stay where you are, don't get out of bed, stay where you are. Hopefully we've practiced through the great shakeout and they know what to do. And I don't jump out of bed. And the reason I don't jump out of bed, I don't know if you knew this um, assembly member, but the number one reason people went to the emergency room after the Northridge earthquake, glass in their feet. Yeah, my thought, mom. My mom jumped out of bed during the Northridge earthquake and ran to my sister's bedroom. And unfortunately a bookcase had fallen and she hit her knee on the corner, you know, the little, the little corner of the suitcase and just, I mean, just went straight at it, you know, and had to get medical care because of that. Exactly. Otherwise, I think they would all be fine, right? So, Well, we want to stay where we are because especially if it's at night, it's dark. The electricity is off now. You don't know what's fallen. You don't know if there's glass on the floor and it might not be safer outside. So if you can resist, if you've taught your children to stay in bed, do not run to them, yell to them and tell them to stay put and carefully assess where you're going because furniture may have moved. Now, my bag, I don't just keep it under my bed. I keep these two straps around the leg of the bed because the first thing I'm gonna want when I, when I get out of bed is shoes so that my, I don't get glass in my feet. But if I just put my shoes next to my bed, they might've moved during shaking. So I keep them in my bag. I keep the bag next to my bed. Let's see, what else have I got? Um, uh, I've got flashlights. I've got, I've got several flashlights and extra batteries. Um, and I've got a mask. Now, this is a dust mask because dust tends to stir, stir up. Like I have a plaster house, so a lot of dust could be in the air. So I have this dust mask. Now, this mask predates COVID. This, is, uh, this has been under my bed for probably several years and there's a gasket in it. So that's good for dust, not good for COVID. So uh, I have my cloth mask. I'm gonna put one of those in my bag as well. Uh, and I have uh, light because I'm going to be able to, I'm going to want to be able to see so I can check out what's going on in my house. I have, oh, I have a, a pair of pants and a t-shirt just in case um, I, I don't want to go outside in my superwoman pajamas if I do have to go outside. <laughs> uh, I have, oh, this is a good one. Not everybody has this, but I do. This is a, um, a tool, you know, like basically a crowbar. And this particular one, because there were people I know after Northridge who the, their houses shifted, they were fine, but their houses shifted and they couldn't get doors and windows open. So mm -hmm. I have this. Uh, this particular one has a little uh, gizmo on it that I can also turn off my gas if I need to. Now I'm not gonna turn yeah. off my gas unless I can smell gas. I am gonna turn off my electricity. I am gonna turn off my water, but I'm not gonna turn off my gas unless I smell gas. And I have gloves, just in case there are things I need to move. There's glass, there are things in the way. Um, I have uh, a bottle of water. Uh, I have, uh, now these, these, maybe I don't need these in my buy the bed kit, but I have them just in case I have to leave suddenly. I have uh, some toothpaste and uh, some uh, change of socks. This is a fanny pack. Oh, okay, good. My blood pressure medication. If I had to leave quickly, if I didn't, you know, if for some reason I had to leave quickly, I have uh, my blood pressure medication, which I can't do without. I have keys to the house and keys to the car. 
just in case. And well, this needs to be updated. Uh, I need to, that's two things I need to do. I need to put my cloth mask in and I need to update this. This is a, um, a thumb drive with the essential information in it. Uh, I also have, oh, leash from a dog and uh, extra pair of glasses because I keep my glasses by my bed, but who knows where they've flown. So um, those are just I think, uh, clothes and water, big bo and a water bottle. And those are the things I have next to my bed. Um, it's not everything, but it's the, it's the things I might need right away. That's great. You know, I, I, I know I was talking to you about this earlier uh, before we started this Facebook Live, but I prepared an emergency kit this summer, right? And um, it, I thought I was prepared for a natural disaster, but when I became chair of the uh, Joint Emergency Management Committee in the legislature, I started to learn more and I realized I'm not prepared and my home is not prepared. And I, how can I be chair of this committee and not be prepared, right? Uh, and so um, I focused, my family and I focused on creating a kit. And what we did is, you know, we um, signed up for like a text course where every day you get a text with the bite size information on what you should do for that day to prepare. And that's how I did mine and it was very helpful. And now I feel better prepared, but you just gave me some new ideas of things that I'm missing in my kit. Well, and if um, anybody it, sees things that I'm missing in my kit, I mean, there's <laughs> another thing, there's no perfect kit. The idea is think about what you might need. So mm -hmm. in my bit, in what else might you need right away in your underbed kit? Uh, if you're gonna shelter in place, if you have kids at home, what might you need? If they don't like tuna fish, Canned food is great, but canned tuna fish isn't good if your kids don't eat tuna fish. Peanut butter is good if your kids eat peanut butter. <laughs> Same thing if you have an evacuation uh, a bag in case you do have to move quickly because of a fire or evacuation or any kind of evacuation. Uh, do, you have, do you have a deck of cards? Do you have uh, games or crayons for your kids when the electricity, the uh, battery goes out and our devices, what are we gonna do? There's, there are lots of things that will make your life safer easier and get you through. And um, so when you're thinking about a preparedness kit, tons of suggestions on terremotos.org uh, slash siete uh, pasos and uh, earthquakecountry.org slash seven steps. Uh, but really it's individual. And like you said, I love the idea that Cal OES has that text site. Uh, I guess your staff can put that up in the chat. Yeah, we'll look for it and post it in that's, case that's anyone great, wants to Because that. the whole point is you're doing it little by little. It's not, um, it, it's a process. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, did you and your family create a plan for how you might get back together if you're in different places when the earthquake strikes? Um, we haven't, you know, at home we did, you know, I live with my mom. My mom um, is there all the time. So we agreed, we put everything in one location that we both know, you know, this is where our emergency supplies will be. Mm -hmm. And we made it, we put some, con, you know, cr some containers and bags to make it easy to pull mm -hmm. out if we need to. Uh, and, and it's central to both of our bedrooms. I think the location uh, we make sure all made sure all of our documents were also there. So if we have to evacuate for some reason, we have our birth certificates, our passports, titles to our cars are in there, all in one place. Which normally, when you need to look for a document like that, you don't remember where you even stored it in the home, and it takes like an hour to find it. Uh, and so that's something that you know, now I know where everything is, not only for an emergency, but just when I need it, right? You know, so it's been, it's been helpful too. And if your home is such that you can't put everything in one place, another thing you can do is make a list and that tells you where things you might need are. So that if you've got, for instance, I don't store my water with my food because that's, we just don't have one spot big enough, but I, but I have a central list that sort of treasure maps me to what I might need. Uh, the other thing that uh, I have, because I, well, we're not out of the house that much anymore, but we're gonna be again someday soon. Um, and when we are, what would we do if we were separated? 
when the earthquake happened. My what husband- What do you recommend uh, for that? Um, one thing we, we recommend is that phones may be down initially, but still everybody in your family should have, know a number, say grandma or aunt Bev or whoever, out of the area. So when phones do come up, you can all call that number and say, it's all right, Luce is at the you know, uh, emergency services office in San Fernando. Um, Mom is at the Red Cross shelter in you know, uh, New Hall. So you can, you can hear, because we found out from the Japanese earthquake that the number one thing that people were worried about was their families. People mm -hmm. who had good supplies at their work because the Japanese are really about supplies got up and left and walked 50 miles home, if that's what it took, to find out if their loved ones were okay. So the more we can do to have a um, meetup idea, in addition to that phone number, we have a, we know that we're gonna, if there's a local disaster, like if the house caught on fire, we know which corner we'll try to meet at. Mm -hmm. If there's a larger disaster, we know the bottom of the hill on Alvarado, that's where we'll meet if our neighborhood is inaccessible. So being able to reunite with your family gives you and your family a lot of um, peace of mind. That's a great idea. That's something I'm not, my family doesn't have a plan. And, you know, I have my family that lives with me, but my sister lives in, you know, Santa Clarita area. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to know how she's doing and I know we're going to be worried about them. Uh, and so do you recommend that the phone number we check into, is it out of state or? Well, it's, what do you think? You know, it, Right after a big earthquake, it's quite likely that phone con phone communication will be down. When it comes up, long distance generally comes up first. First, having okay. somebody out of the well out of the area, I would say, okay. uh, is a great idea. And then some alternatives, like I said, uh, places you can try to meet up if that's possible. And um, let's see, what else? Oh well, my husband and I also have a. a he has a sister in. Uh, San Diego, and we have friends in Bakersfield. He works in Ontario. I work here in Los Angeles. So if he needs to evacuate south, I know where he's going to try to get to. If I have to evacuate north, he's, and we don't, we might not have to evacuate, but if we do, we know, we know where to look for each other. Okay. That's, that's good to know. I think it's very important. Something that we don't think about, right? We're just thinking we need water, canned foods, a flashlight, shoes, uh, but what if we're not home? We're not all home, right? Well, I, I recommend the seven steps to earthquake safe, safety uh, at earthquake.org or terremotos.org because it helps you walk through all the different aspects. How can I make my home safer so there's not as much damage? How can I make the stuff in my home? How can I secure the stuff in my home? So not only I don't want to be hit by my TV, but also I don't want to have to buy a new TV. Uh, so even a smaller earthquake may do damage to the things in your home, even if it doesn't hurt you or hurt your building. Yeah, I remember in the during the 1994 Northridge earthquake, I was in college and I didn't hear from my family. My family was in, in Arlita in the San Fernando Valley, which is by Pacoima. I didn't hear from them for a whole day. Mm -hmm. And I was I was the one watching all the coverage live from Boston um, very worried and you know especially since I recognized a lot of the locations in the San Fernando Valley and it was terrifying not to hear from family for a day and, and I tried I, I called everyone I knew outside of the region to see if they had heard anything we didn't have a plan but I was just so worried um, but finally I think it was already 24 hours later when I heard from them you know so that brings up an interesting thing too uh Preparing your family isn't the only place to prepare. Of course, you can be prepared at work in case you're stuck there, but really your neighborhood is an important place to prepare. Uh, I think it's 97% of rescues are done by people you know, not by the search and rescue folks. There's just not, not enough of them. It's by your neighbors and your family. And so getting to know your neighbors and having an uh, emergency plan with your neighbors so you can help each other after an earthquake is really important. There's a wonderful program uh, that's available in the city of Los Angeles called uh, R 
Ryland, R-Y-L-A-N, uh, Ready Your Neighborhood, Los Angeles. Uh, I'm sure the city of San Fernando mm -hmm. has a map your neighborhood, which you could also access through them. ARC, American Red Cross also has a program that's all around helping neighbors figure out how to get together. In my neighborhood, we all know where each other's gas shutoffs are in case somebody's not home. Mm -hmm. And actually we activated our, uh, our earthquake preparedness group when COVID started, uh, the younger folks started grocery shopping for the older folks. Uh, the, the lady who has chickens uh, brought everybody eggs when there were no eggs. Uh, so knowing your neighbors n will not only help you be safer, but if you're away from your family, you know they've got people around them who can help. That's good, another good tip. Thank you so much, Kate, for getting us started and, and making us think of you know, what we need need to prepare and, and sharing those resources. Um, I want to move on to some questions that we've received. Either my office has received some questions ahead of time. I know some people are typing in questions um, on Facebook Live. So um, I'll share a question and then we'll decide who's the best to answer from both of you on the panel. Uh, the first question is, we always hear people talk about the big one since we have not had any major earthquakes in a long time, does this mean that the pressure is building up for a big one? Who, who well, knows? Yeah, I don't know who knows the answer to that. You wanna take that, uh, Dan? Yeah, yeah. Engineer. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not a geologist, I'm a structure engineer, but I yeah, think it's an answer the question. Uh, you know, the, the, there's a misconception that the, the big one Either you know, there's a there's two things. One is we've had our we've had 1994 earthquake. We have the Selma earthquake. We're done with the earthquakes. We're done. The other one is we haven't had one in 25 years. You know, it's it's gonna be bigger than ever. So so first of all, just because we had one in the past doesn't mean we're not gonna have one in the future. In fact, we live in earthquake country as we as we talked about. So we there are faults everywhere in California that are capable of rupturing at any time. It's, it's all about probability. So we could have an earthquake right now. Uh, we could have another one next week. You know, we, when we had the Ridgecrest earthquake, uh, we had, you know, a couple of earthquakes back to back. So, so they could happen. There's really no way to predict it. Now, in terms of, can it be bigger than ever? Uh, I, I think, Every fault is capable of producing a certain amount of energy. So it really depends on where you're at and how big that earthquake can be. Uh, but, you know, the, 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 when, when people think about, you know, is the pressure building up, I think every, the, the earth is always moving. And, and at some point, uh, these plates actually finally release themselves. And when they release themselves, that's when they release that energy. So, so that's what, that's what an earthquake is, is, is when it's, it's like, it's like uh, the plates are holding on with their, with their fingernails. And at some point they, they let go a little bit and then they shake and that's what we feel. So in terms of, you know, are we, are we building up? I mean, you, I, I suppose you could say, well, there's always pressures that are building up. It's just uh, at some point it's, one of them is going to break. Okay. Kate, do you want to add something? Well, to I would say yes. Yes. And it, it is building up, but it's not that simple. It's not just cumulative. But uh, the, Nor the San Andreas Fault, our largest fault in the area that's, that's capable of producing mega earthquakes, has not ruptured below uh, Lake Hughes for 300 years, and the average rupture time is 150 years. So we are likely to have a large earthquake uh, there is a night, I think it, it's the um, uh, Southern California Earthquake Center came out with statistics that uh, we are likely to have another Northridge sized earthquake within the next 20 years, 99%. So we just, but for us as lay people, here's the deal. We're going to have big earthquakes. We're going to have medium sized earthquakes. We just don't know when. And so we need to be prepared just the difference that is the key, right? Yeah. Let's all this make happened. sure we're prepared. Okay. Yeah. Speaking of being prepared, uh, the next question is now that kids are at home doing distance learning, where is the best place for them to cover 
or to be, you know, we, when I was in elementary school, we prepared, we had earthquake drills, we had to drop under our desks and hold on and we learned, right? So we were prepared if an earthquake were to hit during the school day. But now the school day for many kids is at home. They're on a computer like we are now. So what should they do or how could parents prepare their child? Well, uh, everybody can prepare by joining together and, and doing the Great California Shakeout the third Thursday of every October because physically practicing what to do is important. And the overwhelming message is drop, cover, hold on. Get low to the ground so you're not, no, not knocked over by the shaking. Make yourself small so you're unlikely to be your smaller target for things that are falling and flying and protect your head and neck because those are the parts of our body that are most vulnerable. So if you are near a desk, get under it. If you're next to a, a heavy piece of furniture, get lower than the top of the furniture and hang on to it. If you're in bed, stay in bed. Uh, if you're outside, if you can get low and then try to get away from th things overhead that might fall on you. Um, uh, dropcoverholdon.org, earthquakecountry.org, terremotus.org, all those places can talk, give you lots of ideas about how to protect yourself no matter where you are. And for those people who are mobility limited, the older people among us who might not be able to get down to the ground, don't get down if you can't back up, get back up. You know, if I'm in a wheelchair, I'm going to try to protect my head and neck. I'm, um, basically make yourself a small target. That's and good. I, I, I would probably add that, Okay, go ahead, Daniel. No, I was just going to say, I would probably add that we probably want to make sure that our kids are not sitting underneath a, a tall, heavy, you know, bookcase or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And if, if they are, you, we, we should probably tie it down to the walls. You know, mm -hmm. as, as Kate mentioned previously, most people actually get injured not because the structure itself gave out, it's because of the elements around us. So we want to make sure that we anchor elements that are dangerous and they can fly away during an earthquake. It's kind of fun with great... a hazard hunt. Look around the house, things that might fall or fly, big appliances, bookcases for, a, for $5, you can get a strap that'll hold it. Um, mom's precious china, you might want to move it to a lower, uh, a lower shelf or put some museum putty on the bottom. Also think about egress. What's between you and the exits? You don't want a big belt bookshelf by the front door unless it's braced or it might mean you can't get out the front door. That's a good activity for your kids, right? Have them find hazards in your home, right? <laughs> um, maybe you know, involve the family, right? In, in identifying these hazards. So thank you. Uh, my next question is, uh, if an earthquake strikes while I'm on the freeway, do I stay inside my car? Yes. Stay, what you want to do if you, sometimes you can't really tell what's going on because you're not sure, you think maybe I have a flat tire. If you're on a bridge and you realize there's an earthquake, I would try to slowly keep going and get off the bridge or the overpass. In any case, I'm going to pull off to the side, set my parking brake and stay in the car. Yeah, you know, one of the <clears throat> one of the big things that happens in earthquakes in the freeways is um, bridges. Bridges may may have partial collapses, and as you're driving down, you may not recognize that the a part of the freeway actually collapsed. In the 99 in the 1989 earthquake, uh, we actually saw that happen in the Bay Bridge. So, so where where a small portion of the freeway actually collapsed, and and. In any earthquake around the world, uh, you always see those photographs when after the earthquake, where parts of the bridges actually fell down. I, I was in I was in Chile after their 2010, I believe, now it's, uh, earthquake, and one of the one of the big problems was that a lot of the freeways uh, bridges actually collapsed. So it's best it's best to pull to the side and or you know make sure that you're not continuing driving until there's proper inspection of those bridges. Good to know. Uh, and th these are things that we need to think of ahead of time because I mean, when this happens, we're, we're just scared and we don't know what to do, right? So it's important to make sure we all know this. So thank you. Um, the next question I have is how much does it usually cost to put together an emergency preparedness kit? Well, I think you can purchase emergency preparedness kits 
but I don't really recommend that. It, I mean, it's it, it's one way to you know feel like you've made some progress, and you can do it. But if you do, definite and those can run. Well, I don't know, fifty to one hundred and fifty dollars. But I don't think that's necessary. And if it is, you still want to unpack that kit and see what's inside it. But generally, there are great uh, lists uh, on. Uh, at, on some of those websites I mentioned earlier. Uh, and it, a lot of it is hunting around your house for stuff you already have. Now, if you wanna store water in addition to what's in your, um, your water heater or you wanna buy canned food to set it aside, that's an extra expense, but it's not one you need to take on all at once. If every time you go to the store, you get an extra jar of peanut butter or, um, or uh, can of, uh, you know, a fruit juice or whatever you might have in your shelf stable uh, things that don't need to be cooked, don't need extra water to make. Uh, you can you can build up over time. Uh, you might want to get a uh, emergency kit. Uh, I mean, excuse me, in a first aid kit. It's if you don't have one, it's kind of important to have, you know, for a lot of things besides earthquake. Uh, so there are expenses, but it doesn't have to happen all at once. So I wouldn't try to think of it in, in terms of uh, you know a one-time expense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I built my kit, my current kit over you know a few, like maybe two months or so, just each day. Oh, I, or some of the stuff we already had at home, we had some Band-Aids in the bathroom. And, the, and so I just like, okay, I'll just put these Band-Aids in here, right? And uh, so- And we recommend, if you can, two weeks worth of water, two weeks worth of food, two gallons a day per person in your house, uh, include your pets. Uh, but not everybody has that much room in their house. Uh, but if you do, great. Uh, you can put it in your garage if you've got a garage. But if you don't, the more you have, the longer until or the less likely it is you'll have to go to a shelter. Uh, and having to stand in line for water to shelter is, is my last choice. Definitely. And and we may need extra to help some of our neighbors right, right. that may not be as prepared as we are right but we have hopefully a lot of, the whole neighborhood is prepared right but we have a lot of extra you have water extra room. My, my husband says he everybody knows we've got water so we have to have it i know i would just go to your house if i were your neighbor i'm like she knows what to do this is her work right <laughs> um, i'll just ask her i don't have to do anything no i'm kidding um no but it's also good if you can right to be able to help others absolutely so, that's great that your neighborhood has you as a resource. Well, um, and we have each other. And um, we really learned that at when, after the pandemic, when we just used the, um, the phone list, the email list we'd created for, you know, to prepare for earthquakes. And really, we're so much closer now because we, we're, we're all so close to home so much of the time. Yeah, you know, a lot of the communities in my district in the Northeast San Fernando Valley, uh, you know, the neighbors all know each other for years. There's families that have lived in these homes for generations uh, and go to each other's parties and, uh, and you know, really have gotten to know each other. And this is just another way for them to help each other out during an emergency. And I know that a lot of blocks or, you know, there's communities that are already do this. So, you know, one of the things that we observed, I also went to after the um, Mexico City earthquake a couple of years ago, uh, we went there. And one of the things that we observed was social media, how much it affected our response, because social media was being used instantly to show emergency departments where the major damage were happening. Uh, uh, emergency departments actually started using the social media to communicate uh, ways to, you know, and in, in, in that in certain situations, you know, wait, wait, ways to respond or help neighbors, etc. So we're we're going to be very surprised, I think, and the amount of social media that's out there after a seismic event. And I'm sure that um, you know most organizations, most emergency organizations, are going to have their their web pages up to date and and updating with information, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think that that's one thing that we need to keep in mind. That's true. Can I mention like, about earthquake early warning? I'm not sure if you. Uh, I'm going to. No, you didn't mention. About, yeah. I'm going to yeah. mention about earthquake early warning. Um, after a big earthquake, uh, telecoms and your internet and electricity may all be down initially, uh, and so we may not. Some of the outer areas will get uh, that kind of information back first. Uh, 
and that kind of social media will be very helpful. But in where it's worst, it's going to be dark initially. But there is something new called earthquake early warning. It's uh, been developed by the scientists in the last few years. And you can get a app on your phone. Uh, at, you can, it's called MyShake California. You can go to earthquake.ca.gov. Uh, the, and there, there are several other applications that are based on the same science. And you may be able to get a few seconds of warning before the earthquake happens, before power goes down. Now, what is that few seconds enough to do? It's not enough to, uh, uh, you know, take the laundry out. It's, we don't know if it's just gonna be a few seconds or up to a minute before shaking arrives at your location because shaking arrives at different locations at different times. But it would be enough to know the shaking's coming and to drop cover, hold on, find a safe place, get under or near sturdy furniture, get out from under the giant, you know, a uh, uh, mirror that's uh, above the fireplace uh, and get to a safe place and make yourself safe. Um, earthquakes cause other earthquakes. A big earthquake will have lots of aftershocks. If, uh, if you're in a place where power and, and cell service are up, this will tell you when more earthquakes are coming and you can protect yourself. And it's also just really different psychologically to have even a couple seconds to, before the shaking arrives. Yeah, just, I, I have that app on my phone, um, but when does it, you know, I know there was an earthquake recently, you know, in the area and I heard a lot of complaints, oh, the app didn't work, right? It doesn't go off for every earthquake, right? It, well, here's the thing about it. It's not earthquake prediction. It, it locates an earthquake, a really large earthquake, as it's coming towards your location. You may be too close to the earthquake for the alert to get to you before the shaking gets to you. You may be in a place where the, uh, it seems like the shaking is not going to be so strong that they feel they need to give you the alert. You, there, there are a lot of reasons you might not get the alert. It's not perfect, and to think it's perfect, and to think knowing you have early warning is a substitute for being prepared is a big mistake, but it will help us. And the, the science is gonna get better and better and it's gonna help us more and more. Thank you. Well, we've run out of time. Um, I know there's so much more that we can talk. We probably can talk for another hour about being prepared for an earthquake and learning more about earthquakes. Uh, but I wanna um, thank my, the guests today, Daniel and Kate, Thank you for sharing your expertise and tips to all of us. Uh, I wanna remind everyone that we will be sharing more resources, all of the resources that we talked about during this Facebook Live and some others, you know, we'll, if, but if you have any questions, you could also call my office and we will be happy to share more resources for, for you to, you know. So thank you so much to everyone. Thank you to the team that made this possible um, in, you know, just want to say goodbye. And I hope that you're all very prepared or are motivated after this Facebook Live to prepare for an earthquake. So thank you.